today's program, is, the title is, you know, why Alabama is a biodiversity superstar. And in, I might rephrase that, why is Alabama a superstar? And one of the reasons is because of Dr. Scott Duncan. Um, I've known him for like 20 years and uh, he has only made things better in the environmental community in general public's knowledge about Alabama. Um, he, he's not only an instructor at, at Birmingham Southern, but he's written some very, very important works um, for uh, on the state of Alabama. And you'll have to tell us about the one that's coming out in 2022. Um, his last book was Southern Wonder. Um, with an introduction by E.O. Wilson, and uh, he, had, he has lofty friends. So um, I've known him for quite a long time as an instructor. I've gotten to know his family, and I just enjoy every chance I can to hear him speak. Um, we will be showing quite a few like slides and things, but you know, you will, you will enjoy every bit of it. Uh, he's almost 20 years at Birmingham Southern. And uh, I will ask him maybe to give him, give some more cred credentials because Lord knows, you know, he's got his PhD from the University of Florida and is quite the birder. I do know that much. So if no one minds, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Scott, Scott Duncan. All right, thank you, Shannon. Um, it's a great pleasure to be with you all tonight. Thank you, um, everyone. Our, our time is very precious and our lives are very busy. So for you to take some time out to, to learn a, bit, a little bit more about your state, um, it's a good investment. And you'll know why if you didn't know already by the end of the talk. Um, and thank you, Shannon, for those kind words. Um, I'll say that everything you see here tonight is the product of teamwork um, from scientists to advocates to activists across the state and across the Southeast. Um, I've just used my position to help amplify their voices, their findings and their messages. So um, that's, that's kind, of, kind of my niche that I'm filling in the grand scheme of things getting us to a better place. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is share my screen. So um, as we go through the talk tonight, if there's slides that are particularly interesting to you and um, you could take a, you could use your phone and take a picture of them um, and then ask a question about them at the end. Um, Shannon, what's our time frame again, just to confirm? I would say um, as long as we could, you know, keep it going, um, probably no more than 45 minutes because we'll have people drop out. <laughs> Okay. But sure. um, yeah, we'll see how, how interest is sure. and keep talking. Okay. Well, there will be some places where I'll have to speed through things, but um, you can easily get in touch with me. Um, that's my uh, website right there with contact information, and I can answer follow-up questions if we don't get to them tonight. Um, so there's lots of ways to, to get in touch with me. Um, um, before we jump in too far, I want to... Um, Okay, controls are different when I'm sharing the screen on Zoom. Here we go. Let's do here. So first of all, um, I have one of the roles I'm trying to play, like I talked about, is science communication, getting the word out to people who need to know about um, their environment, science, um, the things that are influencing our lives in some, some profound ways. Um, that started with the publication of Southern Wonder in 2013, which is available through the University of Alabama Press. You can also order that through Amazon. Um, lots, it's written for the public. Um, it's a, I'm told that it's well-written and it's an e easy read and it's rich with information and beautiful pictures, many of which were donated uh, to, for me to use in the book. Uh, recently, just within this year, I've started blogging. Um, my blog is entitled Confluence, the Head and the Heart of Southeastern Ecology. Um, what I'm writing about in the blog are topics that um, don't fit in either of the two books that I've written, um, or they're updates to things that are addressed in those books and those sorts of things. Just recently, I published a, um, a speculative fiction about the future in the year 2020 and doing a canoe and kayak ride with a group of others from Birmingham all the way to Dauphin Island. And 
um, celebrating the many wonderful things we accomplished between now and 2050. Um, everyone who reads it says it's a, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's really inspiring and got them thinking about the future they want to see as well. So um, I encourage you to give that a read. That's on my, on my blog. And the next post, as soon as I can squeeze enough time into one of my days, will be on something. I think the title is, I live in Alabama, but I care about climate change. Is there anything I can do? Um, and I address those topics squarely um, and address them in that new blog post. Um, and and uh, bits and pieces of that are going to be at the end of the talk tonight. I'm also on Instagram, if any of you are on, on, the, on Insta. Instagram, um, mostly wildlife photos and that sort of thing, but you can also keep up with talks that I'm giving and when I've got new blog posts up. And then finally, um, I do have a new book in the pipeline. It's, um, it's under review right now. I'm expecting some good news soon. Uh, it's called Creeks to Coast, Restoring the Rivers at the Heart of American Freshwater Biodiversity. Many of the themes that um, in that book are gonna come out in the talk here tonight. So let's get started. <clears throat> Um, so tonight's focus is Alabama biodiversity. Biodiversity is short for biological diversity. It includes many different levels of biology from ecosystems all the way down to the population level. But mostly when scientists are using it and when I use it tonight, I'm talking mostly about species unless I say otherwise. And um, I think as you know, Alabama has a lot of biodiversity. So we have a lot to explore there. But first a little bit about me. Um, I come from uh, a middle-class family down in the Florida Panhandle, um, born at the end of the 60s and brought up by parents that got hooked on bird watching about, the, about two years before I was born. I was brought up in the culture of going out on the weekends with my parents bird watching and their friends who were a mixture of scientists, advocates, activists, and of course, fellow birders. And so that was my, that was the Petri dish that nurtured me along. Um, so it's really no surprise that um, I became a biologist. Same for my brother, um, my younger brother, who's a biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. That dock that you see there is where I've spent a good part of my um, uh, life as a, as, a, as a young adult and a child. Um, we've rebuilt that dock many times by hand um, after the hurricanes, and it's still a, that's my favorite place on the planet right there. Um, you can see it's been banged up by lots of hurricanes. It's never been straight. Um, and uh, another important part of my life has been birds and bird watching. Um, sometimes it's just a hobby and sometimes it's a meditation to keep me sane. And sometimes it's part of my research and my science. And it's been a, a wonderful adventure. Um, so I, of course, am indebted to my parents for that. And they are still at it. My dad's in his 80s, my mom's in her 70s, and they are bird watching every day. My mom helped document the like the fourth North American record for a rare species of bird that got blown ashore during Hurricane Ida. Um, so their contributions are not just in terms of um, educating others. They do a lot of that about birds and natural history. Um, they lead lots of field trips and so forth, but they also are contributing to the science of ornithology um, in some regionally important ways. So it's perhaps no surprise that when I went to college, um, I started studying biology. Um, the path wasn't necessarily direct, um, and I took a few, you know, sidebar explorations. But eventually, um, I got my degree at Eckerd College um, in biology, and then I went on to the University of Florida, where I um, I got my master's and then zo and then a PhD in um, zoology department, uh, studying uh, tropical forests, and there I am. I'm the guy with all that hair on his head. And uh, um, I spent a lot of time slogging through tropical forests, studying how to get forests to grow back in places where they've been cut down. And so uh, that's what I spent a, a little over a decade doing. Um, then I moved um, to uh, Birmingham about the time that that little baby there was about two years old. And Shannon was one of the folks that helped us through some really difficult years as my wife transitioned into becoming a physician and I into becoming a, a new professor. Always indebted to you, Shannon, for the wonderful times you spent with, uh, with my daughter. Thank you. Okay, so that's a little bit about my background. I wound up in Birmingham about 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago, taking this job at the, this little college, Birmingham Southern College. And I had spent a lot of time on the, in the panhandle of Florida and on the Alabama coast, but I knew very, very little about the rest of the state. 
And that had to change very quickly because I wanted to integrate, you know, features of Alabama into my coursework with my students, many of whom were from Alabama or adjacent states. So I'm gonna divide this talk into four parts. The first part is where I started those 20 years ago, which was what biodiversity do we have in Alabama? And so we're gonna um, get started with that. Now, about the time that I started teaching at the college, this report came out from uh, a research institute called NatureServe. And um, in this report by Bruce Stein, the states of the US were ranked in terms of their number of species, not all species, just those for which we had good lists from all 50 states. And you see here, uh, highlighted on the chart on the right, that Alabama ranked at number five position. Now, many of the my predecessors, biologists in the state, knew that Alabama was special and had lots and lots of species, especially aquatic species. But I think even I think even the uh, the seasoned uh, biologists in the state were surprised to see us ranking so highly. This was the first time that had ever been done across many different groups of species. So Alabama is number is number was number five in the U.S. at that point, but number one among states east of the Mississippi River. So uh, we have a lot of reasons to, to, to brag about when it comes to our biodiversity. Now, this report was in 2002. So just recently, um, I did a reanalysis in the same way that Bruce Stein did his original um, analysis. And I used the same data set from NatureServe, but with all the updated data. And I was delighted to see that Alabama had moved up to fourth position um, just behind Arizona. Um, so we are now, it is official, we are now number four in the U.S. for total biodiversity. And I wrote about that in one of my first uh, blog posts, uh, which you can find on the website. And I go through the details and tell you, um, and here's a little bit of a teaser for you. If you read the, the blog post, you'll see why I think that Alabama is going to ratchet up much higher than it is right now. And maybe one day up there competing against California to, for top position. Um, and we're actually, um, some of us are, are working on that right now. So um, check out that blog post for that and, uh, and you'll read and learn more about that initiative. Okay, but bottom line is for us right now, Alabama is number four in the US for biodiversity. But if you start looking at particular groups of organisms, like in this case, freshwater fishes, we find that Alabama is at the very top. We are the number one state for freshwater fishes at about 311 species. Um, Tennessee is the closest second place at 301 species. So we got a, quite, a, quite a good lead on them. Many of Alabama's fish species are what we call endemic species. Those are species that are only found within, um, in this case, the state of Alabama. We have 20 of those. But we also have 120 fish species that are near endemics. That means we share a little bit of them with adjacent states, Tennessee, Georgia, Mississippi, and Florida. Now, fishes come in all sorts of shapes and sizes and colors and varieties, um, and we rock it out with all of these categories. So if you count just the minnows, the, the, the ones that are flashing and darting about in the, in the waters, um, we have 85 species of shiners. We have eight, over 80 species of darters, these small fishes that hug the bottom of the stream and wait for food to come to them. They're only about the size of your finger, um, not very large at all, some of them quite smaller than that. We have two species of cave fish, fish that are only found underground that never see the light of the day. And we've got over 19 species of catfish. When I came to Alabama, all I knew about freshwater catfish was that there were two varieties, fried and broiled. But so I was blown away to find out that there was 19 species of catfish, ranging from giants in our big rivers to little tiny ones that, are, that would fit in the palm of your hand. Now, to give you some context for appreciating just how rich Alabama is in terms of its biodiversity, I'm going to show you this map put together by Paul Johnson at the Alabama Aquatic Biodiversity Center. Top left, we got the Columbia River Basin, 33 native fish species. That's a huge area, just 33 native fish species. Some important ones, lots of salmon species, but just 33. Colorado River watershed, been hearing a lot about that in recent um, weeks as it's drying out because of the drought and overuse of the water. Uh, Colorado watershed, 25 native fish species. 
And before I show you a little bit about Alabama, let me point out that tens of millions of dollars are invested by states and the federal government in sustaining those rivers in both the Columbia and the Colorado River watershed. Tens of millions a year, okay? Meanwhile, over here in Alabama, we got our little old Cahaba River watershed right at the heart of the state. It's the watershed that's the heart of the state. And it has 128 native fish species. And I guarantee you, it does not get the same amount of investment, neither from the state nor from the federal government. So that Scott, kind of- Scott, that always blows me away. Yes, yes. So we are not investing our dollars where they need to go in terms of protecting biodiversity. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on from fish now. Um, let's talk about some of the other kinds of organisms you find in creeks and, and rivers. Uh, snails. Uh, we have over 200 species of snails. That number will change soon. It will be going up as there's being a, a new study, like looking at the DNA of these species. And there's a lot that we are still learning about them. But it's important to know that we are a globally significant hotspot for snail biodiversity. Um, the Mobile River Basin, um, which is the most of the state drains to the Mobile River down at the coast. So that's most of Alabama. That is the epicenter. That means the heart of North American freshwater snail diversity. And 93 of the species, 93% of the species found in the basin are endemics. That means they are not found elsewhere. So if we don't take care of them here in Alabama, they're lost to the world. They're lost to the universe. Um, mussels. Alabama has some serious muscle power. We have over 180 species. We're ranked the number one state in the U.S. Um, about a third of them are endemics or near endemics. About a fifth of the world's freshwater mussel species are found in Alabama. And um, and it's again a globally significant hotspot. So if you talk to mussel biologists around the world, no matter what language they speak, no matter where they live, they know about Alabama, and they would be very jealous to know that you lived in or knew about Alabama. Okay, um, other groups of organisms: crayfish. We're number one state for crayfish, but this is a poorly studied group of species, and it needs more research for sure. 94 species plus, um, we'll probably see that number top out uh, 100 or more um, as the years go on. Oh, and by the way, yes, some crayfish are blue, just like that picture. That is not photoshopped. Um, some other groups of organisms for our herp diversity, that's a combination of um, uh, reptiles and also uh, amphibians. We rank number four. Um, we're almost tied at number three. We're very close to number third position. Um, ranked number four for uh, diversity. And a lot of that diversity has to do with animals that are related to, again, fresh water. So if you look at turtles, uh, we are the number one state for freshwater turtle diversity. Number three overall, if you include like tortoises and box turtles and that sort of thing. Um, the Mobile River Delta has the highest turtle diversity on planet Earth. So that's pretty intense to be able to say that. That's some serious bragging rights there. So anyway, uh, frog diversity, we're number three. Salamander, we're number five. And I think you get the gist of this. We are um, doing quite well, even for herps, salamander, um, reptiles and amphibians. Cave biodiversity, we are a global hotspot for cave biodiversity in the temperate zone. We share that uh, title with uh, parts of Georgia and Tennessee as well. These are species that evolved to live underground, never see the light of the day. Many are still being discovered for obvious reasons. It's hard to explore down there. All right, so we've got all that species diversity, but we also have ecosystem diversity. It's the ecosystem diversity, which is why we have the species diversity. And you'll hear me pick up on that theme again in a few minutes. <clears throat> um, what, what's the degree of ecosystem diversity we have? Well. Uh, we have ecologists have ways of classifying ecosystems, and it turns out we have 64 types of terrestrial ecosystems in Alabama. So that's not including what we find in marine systems, like out off offshore on the coast. That's just on, on land. It includes wetlands, 64 different types of ecosystems, so many that I couldn't even list them out for you. And this is my jam. This is the stuff I study. Uh, they include 25 types of forest and woodland ecosystems. They include 11 different types of wetlands and seven different types of glades and prairies. Many of our prairies 
while all of our prairies have been converted to largely to agriculture and pasture, I love this painting done by Philip Jarras on the top left that captures the feel of the Alabama Black Belt prairies. That's what we would have seen a couple hundred years ago before it was turned into cotton and, and then later into pine plantations and, and livestock. We also have these weird rocky ecosystems, it's called glades. I'd love to tell you more about that, but we don't have time for that tonight. Um, another key part of why we have so many species in the state are these things, creeks and rivers. We have over 132,000 miles of rivers and creeks. Now I hear commonly people misstate and say, Alabama has more rivers, river miles than any other state, that is not true. You can't beat states like Texas and, and, and Alaska and large Western states. Um, but what is important is of course, what is in our streams. We have tremendous amounts of aquatic biodiversity packed into these uh, waterways. All right, so um, I already talked, I kind of got ahead of myself earlier. There's often speculate, you get some biologists together talking about this stuff and we start, have a few beers, we start speculating about like where we will wind up eventually. It is quite likely that we could wind up um, at or near the top um, for, for biodiversity, even higher than we are today, because Alabama has not been studied as much as these other states like California, Texas, and Arizona. New species are being discovered every year. So um, stay tuned, stay tuned. Okay, let's move into part two of the talk. So I wanna get into why there are so many species in Alabama. Why is there so much biodiversity? There are two reasons um, that we'll get to. Um, they all have to do with explaining why we have so many of those ecosystems that we talked about. So we have to actually, to understand why we've got so many species, we have to understand why we have so many ecosystems. So let's answer that. First of all, there's two parts to this, two answers to this. First of all, is climate. Alabama is a very warm state, you might have noticed. We get lots of sunlight and heat that comes along with it. I split those out because you need the sunlight, um, the radiation for plants to do photosynthesis. You also need the heat um, to keep our growing seasons long and for the bio, biochemical processes that all living organisms do, they, they thrive in, in a warm environment. So we're in the Sun Belt, that helps us out. Same is true for some of the other leading states, Arizona, California, and Texas. We also get lots of rain, and this is what starts to set Alabama apart from those Western states. Um, you're looking at a map here of rainfall during the year, um, average annual precipitation. You see there's two places in the U.S. that get intense amount of rainfall. There's the Southeast, and especially the Gulf Coast and the high Appalachians, um, and then the Pacific Northwest. Um, but we still have Mobile beating out Seattle every year for being the rainiest city in the U.S. All this rain is important. Think about it if you're a gardener or growing plants, you need lots of sunlight, you need warmth, and you need lots of water. So we have the right mixture of ingredients for um, ensuring that we have lots of plant growth in the state and lots of plant growth helps support lots of animals. All right, now one other part of our climate that's important, don't have a lot of time to get into this tonight, but lightning. Lightning is important for making a landscape that burns frequently. Landscapes that burn frequently in the Southeast are healthy ecosystems. These are the, the natural fires that once ranged across most of Alabama were relatively gentle fires like you see here in this photograph. Um, they, would, they would come through and burn some of the latest growth, but the plant roots would still survive, the trees would still survive. They have adaptations for surviving the fires. And these ecosystems support intense amounts of plant and animal diversity. And we had these landscapes from the coast all the way up to the Tennessee line. Um, were forests and, and woodlands and prairies that were dependent on the fires started by lightning. So if you're gonna talk about the importance of climate and biodiversity in Alabama, you gotta talk about some lightning. Okay, so um, this is a map showing what are called the biomes of the world. Um, biomes are large regions that share similar climate and similar ecologies. The darker, cooler colors represent places that get more rain. Um, the warmer colors, like the reds and the oranges, are drier regions um, and that are usually hotter at the same time. 
And what I want you to notice, it is at the, about the latitude of Alabama, um, at about say 35 or 32.5 degrees north, um, you will see that when you follow that dark line across the screen, I think you can follow my cursor, um, lots of dry, warm, hot ecosystems in the Western US. We've got the Sahara Desert, the Mediterranean, the Middle East, and then parts of South Asia, very dry and hot. Um, if we go to the same latitude to the south in South America, dry, hot ecosystems for the most part, same for Southern Africa, same for most of Australia. So that begs the question, when we look at Alabama and also a couple other places on this map, but we're gonna focus on Alabama. Why is it that Alabama doesn't look like this? Why don't we have desert in Alabama? Or if not desert, the chaparral, like you find in uh, central and Southern California. These are the types of ecosystems that you find at those latitudes around the world. Well, the answer for that has to do with this, the Gulf of Mexico. What we're looking at here is a map of the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and you see the arrows representing the flow of water in a current that is called the loop current. Um, the water flows from the Caribbean Ocean up into the Gulf of Mexico, come and reaches our doorstep, and then it goes back south again and out through the Florida Straits between Florida and Cuba. So what we're looking at here is warm, hot, not warm, but hot, tropical water being delivered to our doorstep all year long, 24, 7, 365. What happens is, is that that warm water, it warms up the atmosphere above it. The water is also evaporating into that atmosphere and warm air can hold much more moisture than cold air. And then the winds bring that, bring that moisture on shore. And that is why we get all of our rain. That warm, moist air comes ashore. It, it gets even warmed up even further because land heats up more than the ocean. That warm air rises, you get the condensation, you get the rainfall. This is why the Southeast and Alabama in particular gets so much rain. We can thank the blue current for that. So this is the reason why Alabama doesn't look like um, chaparral or desert. If we were to pave over the Gulf of Mexico, we would see that um, we, would, we would lose that and we would turn to become a very dry uh, place. Okay, so let's step back and then ask the question, what is the overall role of climate in explaining um, the biodiversity patterns that we see? So to answer that, um, this map shows you the state rankings for uh, these states. Um, these are the recent updated rankings. And you see that, all, first of all, you probably already know that these states all have similar amounts of heat and sunlight and roughly same amounts of rain, lots of rain compared to say, you know, the Western states. And you'll see some big disparities there. Alabama's number four, but um, in, in, Miss, in uh, Mississippi's number 15. And yet they both get lots of rainfall. They get, they're also hot and warm. So why are these two states that are like mirror images of each other in terms of overall climate? Why are they so different in terms of biodiversity? Well, we'll get to that in a moment, but this illustrates that there's more to it than climate. Climate's important, but there's more to it. Okay, what's the second part of our answer? We had climate as part of the answer. The other part of the answer is geology. So here we have a map a geologic map of the state of Alabama. And this is actually a simplified geologic map. The actual map shows even more colors. Each color represents a different type of rock or soil system that's at the surface. Now here's how this translates to biodiversity. Every time you have a different rock type or soil type at the surface, you get a different set of plants and animals. Um, and the more varieties of plants and animals you have, the more ecosystems you have, the more ecosystems you have, the more species you have. So in other words, when you switch, if you were to travel and switch between any of these zones, you start to see species that you haven't seen anywhere else. So in other words, the more geologic variation you have in the landscape, the more species there's going to be in the landscape. Now to help us understand that even further, here is, um, well, okay, I thought I had a map here of Mississippi. Um, it was going to show the same map for Mississippi and, or a very similar map and show that Mississippi has far fewer colors. I think I cut that, that slide out for, to save some time. Bottom line is more natural variation yields in geology and also climate yields lots of species. And we got a lot of both. Okay. So geology influences, I think I got ahead of myself again there. Sorry. 
Um, geology influences several things that, that tie in directly to what make ecosystems tick. First of all, um, the bedrock that's at the surface can weather into different types of soils. So if you've got limestone at the surface, you get alkaline soils. If you get uh, sandstone at the surface, you have acidic soils. So right here in Birmingham, you can do a hike from you know, one mountain slope to another and cross between completely different soils and you get completely different plants on both sides of that mountain as a result of this. Um, so the bedrock is tied to the soil variation in the state and the geology also influences the topography. So the illustration at the lower right, you're seeing the nine different landforms you can find in the northeastern corner of the state, uh, the Little River Canyon area. And each of those nine positions in the landscape supports a different type of ecosystem. Each ecosystem, different sets of species. So geology has a lot to do with why the landscape is shaped the way it is, which is what we call topography. And so yet, this is, this is yet again, another reason why geology is influencing things. Okay, here's that picture I thought I expected earlier. There's our map of Mississippi. You see far fewer colors in Mississippi. Most of Mississippi is, um, or much of Mississippi is uh, recent uh, floodplains of the Mississippi River, of course. And then the other bands of the state are shared with Alabama and they're sort of broad and sweeping throughout the state. So you don't get quite as much variation as you do have in Alabama. Okay. All right, overall, this is the geologic map of um, the entire US, well, just the lower 48 states. And what I want you to, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you the biodiversity rankings for the states that are in the southern part in the Sun Belt. So that keeps, these are all states that are warm and lots of sunlight, but the geologies vary and that influences their biodiversity. So states that rank really highly, California, New Mexico, Arizona, and Texas, all have more geologic uh, diversity than uh, Alabama. And by the way, I forgot to change this. These are the old stats from um, the 2002 reports. So that's why Mexico, New Mexico is uh, at number three. Look in the east though, we've got some states near Alabama that are in the teens in terms of their biodiversity. And we've got uh, Georgia and Alabama at four and five. Now zoom in on the southeast. Notice that Georgia and Alabama are very similar in terms of their geologic diversity and they have very similar levels of biodiversity. The states that have lower or, or sorry, it's the states that are ranked lower, um, 16, 14, and, and, uh, and 15 there, they have much less geologic diversity. So again, this illustrates that um, more variation you have, the more species you have. Florida is an exception to that rule because it has climate diversity that the other states don't. So it makes up for its geology diversity almost to, to some extent. Okay. Let's move on to part three here. Let's ask the let's answer the question: Why is Alabama Alabama's biodiversity important? And to get at that, we're going to have to start looking at some hard facts. Um, we are in the midst of what's called an extinction crisis. Um, we are losing species from Earth um, every day, um, and uh, the trend is that if we continue living on the planet the way that we are living now we may see up to a million species go extinct by the end of this century. Now, end of this century sounds like far off, far away, right? But no, children being born today, they would be in their 80s by the end of the century. So we're talking about the generation that will see the most of this change is already alive today, okay? So this isn't the distant future. This is affecting people that are, that are here among us right now. On um, some dire statistics, these dire statistics came out uh, just a couple of years ago with a report from the IPBS and um, that, that it, is, it is humans that are driving these species to extinction. No surprise there, really. But um, this, this report is all of the science that is behind those assertions, behind those trends to help lay it out for us and also laying out the consequences. Now, the species, when, when you think about extinction crisis, um, most folks, what will come to mind is tropical forests and coral reefs far away and, you know, the, you know, the, the savannas of Africa and things like that, or maybe even the high Arctic. But it turns out right here in Alabama, we've got an extinction crisis as well. Um, and that extinction crisis is hurting us because it's hurting what are called ecosystem services. 
This chart here illustrates uh, the main ecosystem services that keep humanity alive and keep us thriving. They provide food and the medicines that we use. I bet that over half of us on this uh, talk tonight are alive because of medicines um, that were derived from nature, from biodiversity. Um, we, would have, we would have died without those medicines. That is true for me. Um, that is certainly true for me. Antibiotics, for example. Um, and the tie between our humanity's ability to stay alive and to thrive, the tie between that and biodiversity is this. Healthy ecosystems provide more ecosystem services and the ecosystem services that they provide are better. So ecosystem services can become degraded. You know, water can get polluted, for example. Um, and it turns out that the more native species that ecosystems have, the higher number of services that are provided and the better quality of those services that are provided. So in other words, extinction, of course, is bad for species, but it turns out it's also bad for us. It's bad for humanity. And that's humanity everywhere, right here in Alabama as well. So what's the extinction crisis really look like in Alabama? Well, it's actually pretty bad. Um, if, when, I rank species, when I rank states in terms of the numbers of species that have gone extinct, uh, Hawaii, not surprisingly, is at the very top. Islands are a special case. Um, we don't have time to get into that tonight, but island populations tend to be extremely vulnerable to extinction. So for all the other states that are on the continent, Alabama ranks number two, and we don't even have a close second. California is, the, is, in, third, is in third place, but it, we are 20 species ahead of California when it comes to extinctions. So, um, this, and these, by the way, these are modern extinctions um, just in the last couple of hundred years. Um, number one on the continent. It's everything from fishes to mussels to my beloved birds. And we are not out of the extinction crisis. Um, we're, we're having a little bit of a pause in the extinction crisis in Alabama, and that's a good thing. It's giving us time to get our act together. Um, but we are not out of the woods yet because... Alabama ranks three for federally listed species. Federally listed is jargon for species that are endangered or threatened on the endangered species list. And you see that we have, um, at least when I compiled these stats in April of this year, 143 species that are federally listed. So that begs the question, what's going on in Alabama? Why are things so, so upside down? Um, because if we're gonna fix this, we have to know what's going on. Well, here's some clues. 74% of Alabama's threatened and endangered species are freshwater aquatic species. 95% of Alabama's extinct species are freshwater aquatic species. So most of the species that we have lost or that are at risk of being lost are river species. Um, so creeks and rivers, all right? So that is obviously pointing that something's wrong with our rivers and creeks. So what happened? Well, for, to understand what happened, we have to dig through some history. And I, I do a deep dive in some of this history in my new book that's going to come out, um, Creeks and Coasts. It has the first thing that, that we did when, when um, Europeans and then later Americans expanded into the, um, into the southeast was that we began to, to harvest species. Um, here you see shad fishing um, on rivers on the east coast and it decimated the shad populations. Um, you see in the top right, sturgeon. Um, these are Atlantic sturgeon that were harvested for their eggs, which were turned into caviar. And at the bottom, you see the results of the process of making shell buttons, something Shannon knows a lot about. Um, we see um, a pile of discarded shells in the center. Uh, these are mussels pulled from the rivers, and you see that they, they had a, a drill press that would carve out little cylinders of the shells and then those would be sliced into little, um, like little button-sized things, and then they drill the holes to make them into buttons. That's what the women on the right are doing. This, this was part of the beginning of the, of the end for many mussel species. Now, we've also changed the landscape a lot in the way that we live on the landscape, not just over-harvesting. Pollution is a big problem. It has been for many decades, um, and it still is. One of the biggest is mud pollution. We get it from construction sites. We get it from agriculture. We get it from urban areas as well. This washes into our rivers, as you see at the bottom left, 
and it makes life very difficult for the species that are living in those ecosystems. Um, so the mussels that you see in the bottom right picture, many mussels have had a, had a tough time because their habitats get silt layer after silt layer after silt layer on top of them. Um, and this mud pollution um, is, is what has been attributed to a lot of mussel decline. Not, I don't think it's the main reason, but it's a major reason why the mussels have disappeared. Another big one is nutrient pollution. This is, uh, nutri we, we send a lot of nutrients into rivers and streams. It's kind of like if you were to over fertilize your plants or your garden, if you put too much fertilizer in there, things would go very badly wrong. And the same is true for our aquatic ecosystems. Too much nutrients that come from um, fertilizers rushing off of our lawns and also our agricultural areas and also too much fertilizers coming in the form of nutrients from our wastewater treatment plants or septic systems um, that are in the wrong position and not well maintained. All that leads to algal blooms in our rivers that ultimately leads to the process of eutrophication to fish kills and the, the law, because of the loss of oxygen in, in waters. Um, so this is another major problem that we have. But even, I would say even worse than that in terms of the extinction crisis is the ways that we have modified our rivers to, to help us do things that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Especially during the industrial revolution, we started building lots of dams. Many of the first dams were small ones like this that were built to make mill ponds that would run water wheels, it would turn um, you know, uh, uh, lumber, uh, it would turn saws and sawmills and uh, grist stones and, and uh, grist mills and so forth. Um, we harness the power of the rivers. But the problem is, is that those become blockages for species moving up and down the rivers. Um, as, our as our dam technology got better, we started building monstrosities like this. This is, you're looking at the guts of the Wilson Dam, which is still up on the Tennessee River today. Um, this is what it was like during construction um, earlier last century. There it is at the bottom left, um, what it looks like today. It's a, it's a beautiful structure, but the damage it's caused to the Tennessee River is irreparable. And then at the bottom right, we see another form of river modification, dredging. That's a dredging rig that pulls up the mud from the bottom to create a channel that uh, barges um, can navigate to, to move goods up and down the rivers. So these are things that destroy a lot of river habitat. And this is, this is probably the biggest cause for those extinctions that we talked about. Dam impacts do, the, the reason dams are so terrible, they just interrupt the flow of everything in the river from the water to the, to the leaf matter, the branches that are part of the, the food for the ecosystems. They keep the sediments from washing downstream and they block the migrations of fishes and insects and, and other animals up and down the river. Um, so this is why dams are terrible for, for rivers. Okay, so all of those so far, those are all what I call legacy problems. Um, they were created largely last century. We've inherited them, um, and, but we do have some solutions and we've made a lot of progress, especially since the 1970s. Still have a lot of progress to go. But now we are facing the biggest fight of our lives. We are facing climate change. Uh, climate change is already here in the Southeast and already affecting uh, each of our lives. Um, let me put this in the big context here with this chart, okay? This is a timeline and we're looking at um, different segments of the timeline. And at the far left, we're looking at the span of tens of millions of years at a time. Whereas at the far right, we're looking at the span from like 1950, roughly to the year 2050, it looks like. I, I can't see it because the our, our own pictures are obscuring that from the Zoom call. What the jagged line that you see running through here is average global temperatures during this time. We have lots of different ways to figure out the, the global average temperatures through this long time period, geologic time, by looking at the rock strata that we have out in our landscape. And this has been pieced together through many decades of um, tedious work done by geologists and verified by different ways of making sure that these, these are accurate. And what I want you to notice is that, um, what I want you to notice is that the, at the far right, temperatures were once much warmer than they are today. But then towards the middle of the graph, um, roughly in uh, the last few hundred thousand years to um, 
up until about 10,000 years ago, we were in the ice ages. Things were very cold with a few heat spikes here and there. And then notice this section here where I'm moving my cursor. This is the last 12,000 years, a period known as the Holocene. This was really important for humanity. This is when we stopped living in hunter-gatherer bands, sort of migrating through the landscape. And we settled down and, and developed agriculture all around the world. Uh, many different cultures developed agriculture. And we were able to do this and start building villages and civilizations because of the stable climate. It made agriculture something that you could do because the climate was warmer and it was stable, it was predictable. So that Holocene, the, the temperatures there, it have only varied about one degree Celsius warmer or one degree Celsius cooler than that average, that long dotted line average that you see spanning the whole graph. Now, look at the far right, see where we are today. We are already well out of the Holocene safety zone. We are now on a new path for humanity um, where we have already raised the global temperature over a degree Celsius and the trend lines are right now for us to raise the temperatures even further. That's why we have to do something about climate change. Otherwise, we are gonna send civilization to a climate that we have never experienced before. And the transition is going to be a rough one. We're already seeing the, the beginnings of that. So what does that mean for the Southeast? What's climate change happening in the Southeast? There's a long list. I've listed about 11 different things on here. I don't have time to talk about all of them, but I'm gonna highlight a couple. Alabama is particularly prone to rising sea levels. We've already seen over a foot of sea level rise on our coasts during this, uh, since the 1900s and more is on the way. And sea level, the rate of sea level rise is accelerating. So we will see more and more uh, problems with coastal flooding. Uh, number seven here, stronger storms and more flooding. That's because of the warmer temperatures. Warm air holds more moisture than cold air and as a consequence, um, when it rains, we don't get the rains that we used to have. We get these downpours that go on and on and on and just pound us with the rain. And that leads to more flooding and all the troubles that come with that, like you see at the picture at the bottom left. We are also prone to harsher droughts. Now, the Southeast and Alabama in particular is naturally gonna have some years that are very wet, like this present year, and some years that are very dry. Our last one being the year 2016. Um, however, climate change is making those dry years, those droughts, even worse than they used to be. They hit really hard and they hit really fast, and it's hard to prepare for them. And that's part of the new normal that we're facing. And then, of course, stronger hurricanes. There's a little bit of evidence that we're seeing more hurricanes. There's strong evidence that we're seeing more larger hurricanes that do more damage. Um, and that's that damage is delivered with heavy rains and heavy winds. And the hurricanes move slower now because the atmosphere is warmer. So they sit on top of a place for a long time and just punish them with rain and winds and flooding. And that's our, that's our new normal now. So the Southeast is actually, when you look at it from an economic perspective, and there's studies that have been done here, the Southeast is this, the region of the US that is losing the most money as a result of climate change, more than any other region in, in the US. Even taking in consideration the flooding that New York and other Northeastern cities get with the occasional hurricane they see, and even taking into consider the drought in the West and even the fires in the West, the Southeast is losing more money and economic um, damage as a result um, from climate change than any other region. All right, so, that's some bad news. What are we gonna do about it? All right, we can't just sit by and let this happen. Here's what we do. We fix this, we fix ourselves. That's part of the solution. And I have the good news, which is it's already begun. So um, I can't read what my title at the top of the slide is because the menu bar here, but this is the Paris. This is what I wanna highlight here is the, the Paris Accord. This was, um, when the nations of the world came together in um, 2015 to agree on limits for global warming. Um, the goal is to keep it at 1.5 degrees Celsius or below of warming um, and absolutely no more than two degrees of Celsius. Um, because once you start hitting the 1.5 and the two um, degrees of Celsius, we start 
changing the planet in ways that we cannot turn back. We hit what are called tipping points. And that's just some severe problems that lie ahead for us. More on that in just a moment. So the, the practical goals mean that we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions globally by 50% by the end of this decade. That's 50% relative to what greenhouse, gavel, green, greenhouse gas levels were emitted each year in the year 1990, okay? That is a lot of work we have ahead of us. If we don't hit that, it's gonna be even harder to keep it below those temperature limits, okay? We also need to aim for hitting to net zero emissions into the atmosphere by the year 2050. Now, what's really at stake here um, is that if we don't hit these limits, we're gonna be changing, like I'm repeating myself here, but it's important. We're gonna be changing Earth's systems to the point that we're going to move into a new climate that is difficult for humanity to deal with. And there's no way to reverse it, at least with known technologies or any foreseeable technologies that we could develop um, in any sort of near future that would be relevant. Okay, so what do we need to get there? What do we have to do to get there? Um, one phrase captures the big picture of what we need to do. We need to transition from, it being, to, from operating an extractive economy to a regenerative one, one that's just as productive and just as fulfilling for human needs and desires, but it's designed in a way, it's engineered in a way to regenerate the ecosystems and the planetary systems that sustain us and keep us help, healthy and happy. Great talk by economist Kate Rayworth um, on a TED talk here, I encourage you to watch. She walks you through this and explains like the, the why right now is so important for making this transition. She is a mastermind for, um, Coming, coming up with a new vision that we should all be embracing. Now, there are three guidelines I wanna highlight for guiding us through this transition that, we're, that we have already started and that we must complete. First of all, this transition must be a just transition. And here I'm talking about the fusion of the goals of the social justice movements around the world with environmental goals. They are, have already started coming together um, you've maybe heard of the field of environmental justice um, that's looking at what people in, are impacted most by the degrade, by uh, ecosystem degradation and pollution and so forth. We must bring everybody along to the new future that we are building. We cannot leave people behind as we have been doing over the past few centuries. We need, first of all, it's immoral to do so. And also we need everybody cooperating and working together to get us to the place where we need to be. So this must be a just transition. Secondly, we need a rapid transition to clean energy and away from fossil fuels. So that means leaving behind coal and also natural gas. Um, natural gas has been sold to us as a bridge fuel that made sense about 20 to 15 years ago when the cost of solar and wind was so high. Those costs have come down now we do not need natural gas as an intermediate step, which is of course a fossil fuel. It's better than coal for sure, but we need to leapfrog past that immediately. And then finally, the third guideline is that we need to use nature as a guide for how to re-engineer how we're living with each other and how we're living with the planet. So these are called nature-based solutions. These reports that you see here, I've got you know, the title pages from just one of several, from four of several reports that are out there, outline the pathway for doing that. The more good news here, scientists and, and uh, everything from natural scientists to social scientists, we know how to do this. We have the tools to do this. We just have, to, we just lack the political will and the sense of urgency to get it done. So those are those three guidelines. Now, I'm gonna zoom in from, the, from that big picture that we've been talking about here to focus back on Alabama and specifically on our rivers and streams, because obviously that's an important part of our future in the state, because we are so important to the rest of the world for our aquatic biodiversity, and it's so important for us. So we have three levels to work on. The first is that we need to upgrade our life support systems that are tied directly to rivers. That's power, water, food, and waste, okay? So power, let's start with that. Um, 
What you might not know is that all of our power that we generate for Alabama and other southeastern states, other than the little bit of solar that we have, it all comes from rivers. It's not just the hydropower dams, but it's also the coal plants, the gas plants, the nuclear plants that are on our rivers and use our rivers for steam and cooling waters. And those are the major, those are actually, when you measure it out, those are the largest source, those are the largest uses of river water in the Southeast and in Alabama. So when we re-engineer our power system, our power grid for more solar and wind, it's not only good for us in terms of clean, less carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and less pollution that's killing thousands of people in Alabama every year, less air pollution, it's also good for our rivers and streams. We also need to re-engineer our water systems to, to use less water to do the same things that we need water to do. Um, so we need water efficiency and conservation. We need to re-engineer how we're growing our food. Already we're making some good progress here with conservation tillage, including uh, no-till farming that conserves water and fertilizer and land and enriches the soil ecosystems, all while producing crops, just as we did before. We can do this. And then finally, we need to rethink waste. Waste needs to become a non-existent thing in our lives. Um, we do not need to be spilling waste into our rivers to carry it downstream and away. We do not need to be shunting rainwater off of our streets and our roofs and our buildings into the nearest um, stormwater drain that goes to our creeks. We need to let that water sit in the landscape and soak into our aquifers and our groundwater because that's what keeps our um, our taps running, uh, keeps our rivers running, and keeps our plants alive. So that's how we need to be treating water. Don't treat it as waste. That's terrible. Okay, so um, power, water, food, waste, changing all that. Is that really how to save biodiversity? And the answer is a resounding yuck, <laughs> a resounding yes. If we don't fix these systems, then the extinction crisis accelerates, and we're jeopardizing our own future. If I could assign you guys a homework assignment, um, a friendly, friendly suggestion that you watch this documentary on Netflix. It's called Breaking Boundaries, and it, fo it follows the science of, of what's called planetary science, looking at the nine different measures of Earth's systems that keep humanity alive and thriving. And that's the diagram at the bottom left. I don't have time to explain that, <clears throat> but all this to say, is that for several of those systems like climate and biodiversity, we are, we are redlining earth. We are pushing it harder than it can sustain us and that must change. And please watch uh, Breaking Boundaries. It's an hour and 15 minutes that will, that will change your life. It's, I'm, I'm likening that to, if you're familiar with um, ecological history and environmental history, it's like the silent spring, the book by Rachel Carson. It's like the silent spring of our era. So please take, take a watch at that film. Okay, now a quick word here about who's got to fix this. There's been a lot of finger pointing on this. And over the years, there's been a campaign to point the finger at the consumer. Um, infamously, British Petroleum um, came up with the idea of the carbon footprint to help uh, shift the emphasis on the consumers of fossil fuels and other things um, for being the fault, to being the blame for everything. Basically, the fossil fuel industry saying, well, if you don't like our products, don't buy them. But the problem is, if you're stuck in a system that doesn't offer alternatives, then you don't have a choice. This is why many of us, including myself, are saying that, yes, personal choice, like changes in your diet and transportation are important. Those are important for normalizing new ways of thinking and living, but they are not going to be able to scale big enough to help us with climate change and the biodiversity loss at the time scale that's involved here. So personal choice is important for developing the habits and the discipline and the focus that we need over the long term. But right now, if you have any time to put into being you know, an advocate for these things, then you I absolutely must focus on systemic change. That means changing things like our food systems, our, especially our energy systems, transportation systems, and things like that. That is absolutely most what we should do. These podcasts are two of my favorite podcasts here that talk about um, these very issues, and we'll unpack this much more better than I can tonight in just a few minutes. Okay, so we're, we're a reminder here, we're going through 
the things that we need to do, the levels that we need to do to save our rivers and streams and ourselves. First was upgrading our life support system. Second, we need to reconnect our river to the landscape. So alongside our rivers, we have these things called floodplains. They're low areas where the river can spill into during floods. They're great for wildlife. They absorb the floodwaters. They prevent flooding downstream. They recharge our aquifers, and they're great for recreation, as you see here in, in the pictures. Okay, um, But over the last century and a half or so, we broke our floodplains. We settled in them. We put agriculture in them. We built levees to keep rivers from flooding. We built uh, flood dams to, to do the same. Um, we filled in wetlands um, and our in our the policies by the federal uh, emergency management um, agency are terrible for promoting um, continued settlement um, and rebuilding in floodplains. And as a consequence of all that, we're seeing more flooding than ever before, injury and sadly loss of life, infrastructure damage, downstream flooding, and habitat loss. This is not the way we should be living in the landscape. And that's that's tough news for folks that are living in these floodplains, but we have to get out of the floodplains. It has to be part of this big transition. There are solutions. Moving out of floodplains can be done. There are economic tools and policy tools for doing that. There's also lots of science that's been put into how to do this in terms of the, the river science side of things, as well as the political science and the psychology of all of doing this. And Frankly, in many areas of the US and around the world, we are doing this out of necessity. Communities are getting so much flooding now that um, people are moving out of communities and not rebuilding. And that land is, is actually being restored into floodplains. So we need better policy, updated policy to speed this transition. It's gonna be good for all the above, for biodiversity, for people, and for climate change issues. Okay, um, another part of reconnecting is taking down dams. We have close to 20,000 dams in Alabama. Um, and I wanna point out that all dams are temporary. They cannot last forever. They are not engineered. They're not built to last forever. Even by the best engineers, you can't build a dam that's gonna last forever. And 60% of the largest dams in the state are already over 50 years old. And a good portion, I don't have the stat in front of me or memorized right now, but Many of them are actually well over 100 years old. Do you really want a dam that's over 100 years old holding back a huge wall of water if you're living downstream from that? The smart answer is no. Um, many of our smaller dams are safety hazards. There are dams in the state. Some of them, some of the dams in the southeast are infamous for being, being drowning mach machines that catch uh, swimmers and others in vortices and they, and they drown. There's no way out. So these are all the reasons to be taking down dams. And what we need to do is that we need to prioritize the dangerous dams and those with negative conservation impact, like this one that was taken on the Cahaba River a few years ago. And we need to be taking those down. It's a long process. It needs the support of the public. That's you guys. Um, and this is good for biodiversity. It's good for flooding issues. And it's, and of course, good for climate change, too. Um, a quick sidebar about hydropower. Um, we can't use climate change as an excuse to build more dams to create power by capturing the moving energy of, of water. We have far better technologies for, for doing clean energy. That's solar and wind right now. Um, besides, the best sites for building dams are actually already in use. So it, it, we're barking up the wrong tree here if we're looking for solutions. So some of our dams do need to be kept and upgraded um, with more efficient turbines that can generate more electricity, and that'll help us get to the point where we have enough electricity from wind and solar. Um, that'll also maybe buy us the time where we can get um, uh, fourth generation nuclear as, as a possibility, um, which is much, much, much safer um, and more efficient than these old ginormous nuclear plants that um, that have been built in the past. So that's what we need to be doing. And for the other dams, we need to start planning their removal. It takes many, many years to plan the removal, especially of a big dam. Um, so we need to get started. All right, um, when we remove dams, many, many good things happen. Um, river species obviously able to migrate, rivers are then able to do the thing that they naturally do. And that I wanna focus on what happens at the coast when we do that. Um, 
Dams are holding back sediment and freshwater and nutrients that are essential to sustaining our fisheries, where we get our recreational fish like speckled trout, but also commercial species like shrimp and mullet and blue crabs. Um, when we release this water and the, and the sediment and the nutrients to the coast, our coastal ecosystems begin rebuilding. And we need them to rebuild everything from the oyster reefs that you see here to the barrier islands. We need those ecosystems because they are very efficient and cost-effective at protecting the coast from storm surges that come ashore with, with hurricanes. Um, and the other perk here is that we let river species return to our rivers like sturgeon and shad, and they can rebuild their populations. Okay, so the third and final piece of the river revival is to restore species and ecosystems. Fortunately, again, we've got a head start on here. Um, these folks here at the Alabama Aquatic Biodiversity Center have been bringing mussel and snail species back from the very brink of extinction and uh, growing them in the, in the laboratory setting and then putting them back in rivers and streams that have been restored. And that we need more of that um, happening throughout the Southeast and here in Alabama to, to bring to, so we don't have so many species on the endangered species list. And this will in turn help us rebuild our ecosystem services that are indispensable, irreplaceable and invaluable for sustaining humanity and our capacity to thrive. Okay, uh, I don't have time for a sidebar here with mussels, but let me point out on this slide that we're doing a lot of this work. We're restoring the longleaf pine forests in our uplands and along the coast, we're rebuilding um, oyster reefs. Um, in the far right, you see a project that everybody in Alabama should be proud of. That is Lightning Point at Bayou Battery, the Nature Conservancy and its partners res uh, restored, restoring marsh and oyster reefs and protecting the port of Bayou Battery and from uh, sea level rise and the, and the storm surges that come ashore with hurricanes. And that is, um, it's the biggest project of its kind on the Northern Gulf Coast and will be the inspiration for many more projects like that. All right, so um, this is just a sort of summary of, of all that. Um, I wanna point out that um, we have the science, we have the technology, but what we don't have is enough people demanding that we, um, we have the policies in place to get this done and get it done quickly, okay? So how can you help out? You can do what you're doing tonight, keep learning about rivers, keep learning about the environment and climate change and the policies we need. Policies aren't all that sexy, I, I admit. Um, I have to like drink a strong cup of coffee to get me to focus on policy, but it is essential to our future. Number two, and this is a critical message tonight, collective action. That's how we get the policies we need. We're not gonna get it by acting individually or making adjustments in our own ways that we're living. We have to come together and demand the policies and demand the actions that we need to protect us and to protect biodiversity as well. What I've listed here what, with these icons are some of the groups in the state of Alabama, not all, but some of them that focus on climate change and also focus on environmental justice and social justice. These are the groups that are doing the hard work, the essential work, the good work that needs to be done. You can support them in many ways according to what you're able to do with your membership, with your donations, you can join with them and advocate for policy. You can offer your ideas and opinions on how, what that policy should be and, and brain, brainstorming, working with these folks. You can offer your expertise if you have it. You can offer your time or your talents. There's no reasons to be on the sidelines here. This is an all hands on deck uh, moment for humanity and the earth needs you, um, Alabama needs you, um, muscles need you, and you need you. We all need to be out there working for this. All right, so that's a wrap, folks. Um, again, this is uh, the different ways that you can learn more about my thoughts on this and how to move forward. Um, my blog is in, over the next um, couple of weeks is gonna be posting more about how to get engaged and, and make a difference as individuals working with others because that's a critical piece, especially in a state like Alabama that is deeply red, it's yeah. deeply red, and, but we can change things and we will change things because we must. So with that, I'll, with whatever time and patience you guys have, I'll take all the questions that you have, even if we stay well, here till midnight. I have bad news. We're I'm out of time. I'm, I'm running Zoom, and my computer just said it's going to restart in 
nine minutes. Okay. <laughs> I have works. no control over that. Um, I do have a couple of questions. I don't know if they're easy or hard, but Gabrielle does say, are there any, you know, documentaries or white papers or anything about cities that have been, or towns that have uh, resorted back to floodplain? I mean, any information about, you know, yes. the re rewilding of some, some yes. areas? Um, the, there's lots, lots of things. Um, for, so one thing on the coast, you can, you can read about the Lightning Point um, project down at, uh, at Bayou Battery on the coast. Another really good resource is a podcast by the Southern Environmental Law Center. Um, their podcast, they had uh, several seasons focusing on sea level rise on the Atlantic, excuse me, on the Atlantic coast, because the Atlantic coast is sinking faster um, than the, um, the Gulf Coast, the Northern Gulf Coast. And a, a lot of the focus of that podcast is on how cities are adapting to that. And a lot of that is transferable to inland as well. And then a third resource there would be, and I showed the slide of it, it was that report um, by the, here's what you need to remember, it's the World Wildlife Federation, WWF, that's the panda bear people, right? Mm -hmm. And they've got a fantastic report on uh, nature-based solutions um, for, for flooding. That's not the exact title, but it's something along those lines. Re you can watch this after, um, or just email me, I'll, I'll send you a link. Oh. Cool. Okay. Yeah. And also, um, I'm afraid of the answer of this, but you know, have have cities and towns decided to try to shore up dams rather than getting rid of them? Is there ways to make them safe? Or I mean, is that the the right option? Even um, you know, these what do you yeah. see happening out there? Dams are about as idiosyncratic as we humans are. Um, okay. Some are old, some are young, some are cranky and hazardous, and others are, are, are still safe. Um, and and, they're, and they're used, their usefulness varies. Um, a lot of dams in the state are no longer useful. They were built for, you know, for yeah, grist they don't mills. serve a purpose, right? Yeah, they don't serve a purpose anymore. They're just a, a danger. Um, so it really depends on things. Um, I forgot the exact nugget of the question can you repeat that again for me? um just if if there's ways to make them safe um, yes so so a, a lot of our bigger dams are um the ones especially the hydropower dams and so forth and the ones operated by the army corps of engineers those are maintained continuously and so those tend to be our, our safer dams but we have a lot of derelict dams that no one's really maintaining and they're just you know concrete essentially rots Especially um, concrete that's there's that's cracked. Um, water gets in there. The, the iron that's used to reinforce the concrete starts to rust. Um, there's some there's some dangerous dams in the southeast in Alabama. Um, and in those cases, yes, you can repair them or replace them, but it is tremendously expensive. I mean, you're talking about throwing t up to tens of millions of dollars on a moderate sized dam. It is far far cheaper to remove that dam. And restore yeah. the river. It's, uh, I mean, bridges are in the same state. They're supposed to be maintained continuously, but some are getting to the point where you know they're they're dangerous. But um, is there a movement to remove dams, like a specific group yes. that's doing well, that? Uh, so nationally, there is. There's a group called American Rivers, and they promote a lot of the tools that are needed at the state level for this. U.S. Fish and Wildlife has this as a priority. Nature Conservancy has this as a priority in the state. Um, there's a study that's launching just this year to look at the first dams up from the coast on the, on the uh, Alabama River, the Miller's Ferry and the Claiborne Dams, um, to look at how to build a fish passage and, or some other ways of getting those, you know, you know, dealing with those dams and making it more of a natural situation instead of being a barrier. And so, the, and so there's you, not a unified program in part because some dams are owned privately, some are owned by utilities, some are federal, some are state. It's all over the place. Oh, and it, and so really the, the effort, the movement has had a hard time really generating a lot of momentum because, A, we haven't 
put the policies in place that sets aside funding for the studies on and, and the actual removal. We haven't done that at this at the state level or the federal level. And B, these dams are so idiosyncratic. Um, so th those, are, those are some big challenges. But the good news is if you look at the rate of dam removal in the U.S. and here in Alabama, that trend line is headed up. And so there's good news there. Awesome. Yeah, um, I would imagine that when looking at the feasibility of restoring or getting rid of, you know, there's, there's a lot going on. Um, I, I really, really appreciate you talking, Scott, and it was just right at my level, you know, a cool. little bit of science thrown in, but a, a lot of interesting facts. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, sure. Well, folks, you know how to reach out to me. Um, I do encourage you to, to look up my blog and please um, sign up for emails for my blog um, so that you can get notifications as soon as new uh, posts are, are up. Um, or follow and or follow me on Instagram, and I can keep you up to date with important um, stuff that's going on with regard to these issues. Um, thank you all for being here tonight and taking some of your valuable time to spend thank it with me. Thank you so much, Scott. And everybody stay tuned to the Hoover Library's calendar of events and um, hope to see you again. Um, thank you so much, Scott, and I'll talk to you soon. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Shannon. Thanks for making right. this happen Thanks for everybody. Thanks, everybody.